Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, good evening, everyone, rather. Uh, first of all, I'm really excited to be here at Europe. I think it's my first time. Uh, and it's also amazing to be the speaker here. So thanks to everybody who was involved in selecting talks and uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about uh, non-blocking IO, and specifically, how does that work with Python? Uh, so a very high-level overview. Uh, we are going to look at what is not blocking IO and uh, try to understand this by examples. Uh, and essentially, why, like, why do we need to do this, uh, really? So this is going to be uh, not very practical examples, but understanding of the concept uh, as to what really goes on uh, when you talk about non-blocking IO and you know, when, whenever you try to use that practically. Uh, and it is a, a rather beginner level talk, so uh, expect the content to be like that. Uh, but just a little introduction about myself. I'm uh, Vedic. Uh, I've been working with Python for about four years. Uh, as of now, I work with a startup uh, based out of New Delhi, India. Uh, and I'm an infrastructure engineer there. Um, and just in case if you want to connect with me, here are my, uh, some of the social networks links. Uh, but some background uh, as to why I'm doing this talk. Uh, when, uh, long back when I was in college, I started out as a web developer. Uh, and just out of curiosity, you start moving down the stack, exploring more things. Uh, and uh, somewhere there was this project which required, uh, it was a web application, required a little bit of um, scaling to handle more connections on just one box that was very limited resources-wise. and. Uh, uh, just along the line, when I was uh, checking out some material, uh, some some content around how to scale web applications, I encountered Gevent, uh, and well, I used it, and but then was it was that time when I didn't really understand how it worked. So always wondered how does this thing really work. Uh, but other than that, uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is something that I have not really seen anybody talk about. In, uh, at, especially at any Python conferences. You would see ev just about every other Python conference have a talk on Twisted or Tornado or Async IO these days. In fact, there's a, I think there's a workshop going on right, right now parallel to this talk. Uh, but nobody really talks about what are the underlying infrastructure that these libraries or frameworks make use of. Um, and I, I plan to shed some light on that. So uh, non-blocking IO or just before we start understanding what it is, uh, let's look at what is blocking. So blocking, the, just a very simple definition of, of it is a function or a code block uh, is blocking if it has to wait for something to complete, right? Um, th that's probably the simplest definition I could come up with. Uh, and what that means is that, let's say if you have a function that makes a HTTP request to another uh, API, uh, and does something with whatever response it gets. The script cannot really progress until it gets a response. Uh, extend the same example to any kind of network, uh, network interaction, network call. Uh, for example, talking to your MySQL or Postgres database, um, and your application cannot progress or do the next thing until you get a response back from that. Um, other examples could be, uh, you know, you have some function that does some statistics or some, some mathematical computing, uh, computation, uh, and that just takes time. Uh, for example, some complex integration, and it may take a while before the next thing can be done in the program or in the application. Uh, another example could be waiting for uh, the user to input something, uh, for example, on the console. All these things are blocking. So the problem with blocking code is that it is capable of de delaying execution. Uh, and as long as tasks are related to each other, that's fine, because you cannot do one thing, because it depends on the other one. But what if there are independent tasks in your application which can actually progress uh, with each other, if not at the same time? Uh, so for example, you have a single-threaded web server, which is usually the case in Python world. We don't really write many multi-threaded web applications, uh, at least with CPython. Uh, and you get a request 
uh, your request handler is running, and it makes a call to your database. And at the same time, you get another request. So the first handler is running, it's single-threaded, your web server. It cannot really serve the other request because the first request is blocking the other request. Uh, another simple example could be that you have workers consuming tasks from some queue, and usually you offload you know, heavy processing to workers, which asynchronously process your tasks. So if your worker is doing something uh, and it is blocking, well, it could be any reason why it's blocking, but if it is non-blocking IO, for example, it is blocking because of IO, uh, then you're basically not doing anything at that time because when your code gets blocked by because of IO, uh, you're not really making use of any CPU. Uh, but what it really comes down to is that the overall system is not able to progress. I mean, blocking is fine, but uh, blocking other things that are independent, which could be done while uh, while any other thing is blocking and not doing anything uh, pro uh, you know, useful at that time, uh, that is not good. And as, as engineers which, who, who want to like, write systems or applications that need to serve multiple uh, of users or multiple of uh, you know, consumers, may, they may be users or they may be any other application, we don't really want that. Uh, so now let's talk about IO, at least for modern uh, applications, the applications that we write today, uh, things like dealing with the network, uh, reading or writing from your file system, uh, doing operations on pipe, these, these are the kinds of things that would fall you know, under I.O. But uh, That may not be exhaustive, but uh, in general, if you want to define uh, you know, any kind of I.O. operation, it would be dealing with file descriptors or doing any operations on file descriptors. Uh, so today, at least for the scope of this talk, we are going to be we are going to talk uh, about dealing with the network and uh, how how to implement non-blocking I/O uh, while you know doing networking in Python. So non-blocking I/O is essentially dealing with I/O so that it does not block execution or execution does not get delayed because of I/O. Uh, and to understand that, let's let's look at uh, some example. I don't know if that is. Uh, is that is that good enough for people to read? No. Yes. Okay. It's 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 small. Yes, it is small. Uh, that doesn't seem to be helping. Um, okay. What I can try to do is give me a moment. Better? Yes, all right. So, uh, yeah, so we, we, uh, we, we look at some code in Vim instead. Uh, so this is, this is a very hello world kind of a thing that we uh, look at when we start out with network programming and, and Python. Uh, this is a simple, very simple server. And uh, written in Python, all it does is it accepts connection, uh, it waits for some data from your from the client that has tried to connect, uh, gets the data, prints that data, and uh, then waits, tries to get more uh, data, and does that as long as the client is trying to send some data, right? So th this is the this is a very simple script. Probably most of us here in the room who have done any kind of network programming in Python would have uh, written something like that. Uh, so for the scope of this talk, we are not really going to be making use of this anymore. This, 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 this is as simple as it gets. We won't really look at this again. Um, and here's an, you know, an almost as simple client as our server was. Uh, there's again nothing. It just tries to connect to the same server, this client, and tries to send uh, some data. Uh, to be precise, it tries to send about 70 MB of data or so, yeah? so. Uh, when we, I should in fact have the server also open. Uh, yes, I don't know if that is um, 
I I was counting on my slides to where uh, so that I hope that uh, content was readable, but um, probably we'll have to make do with this. Uh, so here there, there's a server again, uh, and if we l look at this code on on line 11, uh, the server blocks because it waits to receive a connection. It won't proceed further unless you know it, a, a client tries to connect to the server. And after that, on line 13, it blocks until the client sends some data to the server so that the server can actually read the data and do whatever with the, with the data it wants to do. Um, then it prints out the data and then blocks again when it tries to get more data from the client. And keeps on doing this until the client stops sending any data. Uh, on the other hand, uh, our client script blocks at this call where the, uh, the client is actually trying to send all of that data. That is 70 MB of data, so I mean, it's understandable that it'll take a while. Uh, and both the client and server, as of now at least, they block, right? So um, I'll just rush through the slides because this is what I was talking in these slides there. Uh, and the problem with this is when we run this, the assuming that the server is running a client, the client takes about 45 seconds to run on this machine that I'm using right now. Uh, and while it was just trying to, I mean, the script, the client script was not really trying to do anything as such uh, other than sending the data, but if it really wanted to do something, it couldn't have because the script would just block on socket 10. So uh, let's see how we can improve that. Um, so for non-blocking network IO in Python, at the most basic level, what it comes down to is this. Uh, you make a socket non-blocking by calling the set blocking method on it and tell it to not be blocking anymore. So you pass it a false or a zero, and it makes the socket non-blocking. And how does that work, and how does it uh, really look like in real world? So um, again, I'll switch back to the Let's switch back to Wim here. Uh, and this is the same client that I was, I was showing earlier, but just with one minor change, there's one additional line here. On line five, we have set the socket uh, to be non-blocking. And uh, everything else is, is exactly the same. And when we run the script, or when we run the client, uh, it's not exactly the same thing. We see an assertion error as we had put an assert statement on the on the last line of the script. And it says the bytes sent uh, to the server is not equal to the bytes we wanted to send. Uh, now, this happened as soon as we changed our script, our client script. And uh, what set blocking did was that it did not send all of the data. Uh, so the, 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 subtlety, the subtlety here is that when in the previous script, when the socket was not non-blocking, or the socket was blocking. Um, how sock.sen really works is it makes whatever system call it needs to make to send the data to the other uh, process on the other end of the connection. But what really happens is the process uh, copies or sends the bytes that uh, it wants to send to the other side and passes that to the kernel. So the, kernel, the, the amount of data that can be accommodated in the write buffer of, of the kernel for, for that write call or for that send call gets passed to the kernel space. Uh, the kernel gets that and then basically puts the process to sleep because the write buffer is full. So, and that's the reason why I call, our call gets blocking. So when the call was blocking, uh, it, uh, the, the process passed the number of bytes it could to the write buffer. Uh, then the kernel takes care of that, sends it across to the other side of the uh, connection. And then in the meantime, it puts the process to sleep. And then it brings the process back up or wakes the process up when the write buffer goes empty. Uh, and then gets uh, more bytes to send and keeps doing that until all the data has been transferred. And while the process is sleeping, it's not really making use of any CPU, so we could potentially do something else in that time. When we made that socket non-blocking, sock.sent returned immediately. Basically what happened was it just transferred the number of uh, bytes or the amount of data it could 
gave to the kernel to send to the other side of the connection, and returned immediately saying, these are the number of bytes I could transfer so far. Uh, so it just sent the number of bytes it could immediately and not block at all. But what it gave us back in return was the number of bytes that were transferred. And that was that is useful stuff so that we can, as of now, our client fails, it does not send all the data. But we can use that to send all the data in another way. So let's look at another improvement to that script. Uh, here's uh, a slightly different uh, client. Uh, all we're trying to do is essentially the same thing, our socket is non-blocking, but we put that in a, in a while loop as long as uh, we have not sent all the data, it just tries to send that data again and again and again. So uh, soc.send returns immediately telling us the number of bytes that were transferred, and now that we know how many bytes were transferred, we can try to send you know, the remaining bytes in the next iteration. Uh, so this, th this is essentially how we made our socket non-blocking. Uh, and we keep trying, we, we just keep trying to send more data. Uh, and as soon as, uh, the, the problem with the script here is, uh, it, well, the good thing is that we have achieved non-blocking socket or non-blocking IO here, but we are wasting, again, a lot of CPU cycles in running that while loop because most of the times, uh, we will not be able to send that data because write buffer will not be empty. So if we if we run this, actually, uh, we will probably end up spending most of our time in this exception block instead of actually being able to send this. And this, it will actually go here and succeed only if whenever uh, that is seldom the write buffer goes empty. Uh, and this is, this is, again, a good improvement or a good change. We can now make use of this to make more improvements and probably do something more useful instead of just only trying to send this data. So uh, I'll show you another uh, another improvement to the to this very client uh, with some minor changes again. And this is, again, the same, uh, pretty much the same uh, client as we saw just before this, again, but with one extra line, which is just this. Uh, and this is something new, which probably, if, if you've not really ever tried to look into how non-blocking IO, or n not just non-blocking IO, but uh, you know, this kind of infrastructure works, this might look new. Uh, select, basically, the, the, so we, we are doing exactly the same thing, but our while loop will block at this line as long as we don't have the same socket available for writing again. So as long as the buffer, the write buffer becomes, uh, uh, it, as long as the write buffer is full, uh, this call will block here. So what select does is, uh, it, it, it stops us from wasting those CPU cycles that we were you know, uh, uh, wasting earlier, uh, trying to call soc.send again and again in every iteration of the while loop. Uh, but what does select exactly do is uh, rather uh, interesting. So select is nothing but a system call, uh, and it's, it's an infrastructure provided by the operating system for monitoring file descriptors for events. So events like, is a file descriptor ready for writing, or is this file descriptor ready for reading? Or is this file descriptor ready for handling some kind of exceptions? Uh, and uh, what select, the, the select API that we just used, what we saw there, is, is just a wrapper of the, uh, uh, direct wrapper of the syscall, but it also makes using select uh, rather simple as compared to uh, the C API. Uh, but if you understand how to use it with Python, you would probably be able to make sense out of it when you look at some C code. Uh, and uh, the signature is like this. You pass select uh, three subset, uh, three sets of file descriptors, or three arrays of file descriptors. Uh, and these arrays are basically um, three different arrays which you want to monitor for either read event or write event or uh, an exception on that file descriptor. And uh, there's a fourth optional argument, which is timeout. 
which basically tells uh, how long do you want select to block uh, until any of the file descriptors passed for monitoring become available. So earlier in our previous example, we did not use that um, uh, fourth argument, so select would blo block indefinitely, but oh, you can change that and uh, adjust that according to your needs. And it returns uh, a subset of file descriptors as passed earlier, uh, telling these are the file descriptors which are available uh, for performing whatever operation you wanted, you were monitoring them for. Uh, and when we talk about file descriptors, at least uh, in Python world, what select accepts is any object that implements the file number method. Uh, so uh, uh, usually sockets have a, I mean, not usually, in fact, all sockets have a file number method on them because sockets are essentially uh, file descriptors. And uh, at least in Python, we have, uh, if you call file number on socket, you get uh, the corresponding file descriptor for it. So, uh, so the, a good improvement that we made here was that we, at least, uh, we are doing essentially the same thing, that is trying to send data again and again in a while loop, uh, but we make our process uh, uh, as long as we don't have another, we don't have our socket available for you know, uh, performing that operation. And here we look at one last example, which is where, so far we have only been trying to, you know, uh, send data in a non-blocking fashion uh, and not doing anything along with it. Uh, but essentially the idea of doing non-blocking IO is that uh, even if you are single-threaded uh, and uh, well, while you are not doing anything constructive, you should be able to do something else if you can. So here's, here's another uh, example. Uh, continuing with our previous example, but just changed a little bit. Uh, we have created two tasks. One task is uh, the same that we wanted to send some data uh, uh, to our server, and the other is just a task which makes use of CPU, which just tries to increment a counter. And we have put a sleep there just so that if we, uh, when we run this, uh, the, the output is you know easy to read. So um, we we what we what we are going to do is we are cooperatively uh, uh, let both of these tasks proceed uh, with the help of generative functions. So this is one task, which is essentially a generative function. Uh, it increments a counter in a while loop, and it yields after every iteration. And the other task is the same thing that we were trying to achieve in our client, uh, and it's, again, the same code, uh, which is trying to send the same amount of data, but the only difference is that where we were calling select, instead of calling select there, we yield, and we uh, yield the socket that we were, socket object that we were using for uh, sending this data, and we also yield what the operation that we want to monitor this, um, this socket for. And finally, we have our main block where we implement uh, another a slightly different version of our uh, previous uh, ugly while loop. Uh, probably this is uglier. Uh, but here we, what we do is we try to execute both these tasks uh, one by one and then monitor for file descriptors and execute the corresponding tasks uh, whenever the file descriptors are ready uh, uh, to take more data. So here we have, uh, I mean, you don't have to read through the entire code, but the, the essential thing to understand here is that what we are doing is we, are, we have a huge while loop where, uh, where we are running this while loop as long as we, has, we have some task to execute or we have some file descriptor to monitor. So whenever there is a file descriptor to monitor, the reason is that uh, there is some task that wants to perform, uh, do something after that. Uh, when the file descriptor becomes available for doing that operation. Uh, so all we do is we run every task one by one, and if the task or the generator function for the task yields a socket and asks us to monitor it, uh, we, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we just keep a mapping of all those file descriptors and the corresponding task. And further down, we call select to monitor those uh, uh, those uh, file descriptors or socket objects 
and uh, do whatever needs to be done accordingly. Uh, the difference in this select call is that we have used the timeout uh, 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 argument here. And we have set the timeout to be zero because we don't really want to block. Uh, why don't we want to block? Well, uh, if the file descriptor is not ready for execution, we at least can let our other uh, task, which was incrementing counters, proceed as long as these file descriptors are not ready uh, for any operation on them. So uh, we call select, and on every iteration, we check if the file descriptor is ready to be monitored. And we create a pending tasks list where we keep pushing the, the task that needs to be you know, executed in the next iteration of the while loop. And this is pretty much it. So the, this, this, these changes, although not pleasurable, again, probably I'll share this code somewhere so that you can read it um, when, you're, when, you're, like, when you have more time at hand. But uh, what we really achieved here was cooperative scheduling using generator functions and select, and uh, we let two independent tasks uh, proceed um, along with each other in a single thread script, uh, and you can actually say that this is probably our first uh, you know, network event loop implemented here. It's, it's a poor man scheduler that we also implemented. So uh, I think I have just one minute left, um, and I'm going to rush through the rest of the things as soon as possible. So um, select, we, we just looked at select, but our operating system actually provides more infrastructure for uh, monitoring file descriptors. There's something called poll. Uh, poll came uh, soon after, I don't know if soon after select, but uh, the implementation or the technical details are pretty much the same other than the API um, itself. Uh, it is probably as bad as select, so time complexity uh, for select and poll is probably the same. Uh, ePoll and KQ are pretty much the de facto's today. Uh, most of the you know, uh, web servers uh, like Nginx uh, make use of ePoll and KQ. Uh, if you're using Twisted Tornado, uh, G event uh, on Linux or BSG systems, chances are that you know, they have ePoll implementation or KQ implementation and you're using it. Uh, uh, and uh, I think I don't have more time, but uh, yes, I'd be happy to have more questions. Um, other slides were essentially about uh, what are the libraries you have uh, in the Python world, but probably we can catch up if you want to know more about that. So any questions? Well, this is maybe more related to the system, uh, but are you aware of the limit of uh, asynchronous uh, connections you might have? Any top limit? Uh, a limit of synchronous connections. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not aware of that, but if there is something like that, I'd, I'd be happy to know about it. Yeah, well, in Linux, well, I was uh, testing one uh, tunneling server and it had like uh, 4,000 because select in the C API of the uh, About kernel. select, yes, yes. Select is, is indeed limited by the number of uh, file descriptors, but I, I think uh, you can change that if you are compiling the operating system yourself. So there's a, uh, but, but, well, we don't do that. So yes, most of the times you'll be limited by the number of file descriptors you can monitor using select. Okay. Uh, uh, but, uh, but having said that, I, I mentioned something about select's time complexity, that uh, select as compared to ePoll or KQ tends to be slower and um, nobody really uses it. Uh, but this, uh, it, it really depends on what is your use case of using select. So if you don't really have many file descriptors to monitor, probably select would be a better choice to make as compared to ePoll before ePoll actually starts shining out. Thank you so much.